Hello, uh, good morning. Welcome and thank you all for coming to this great conference today. Uh, we have uh, two special guests from the Australian Parliament, led by Senator Darren Hinch, who will be speaking to you shortly. Uh, before they do that, kindly allow me to give you a brief introduction of them. Our first guest and speaker is uh, Senator Darren Hinch from Darren Hinch's Justice Party in Australia. He's the chair of Joint Select Committee on Oversight of the Implementation of Redress-Related Recommendations of the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse. <coughs> He's also a veteran media personality in Australia, known particularly for his work on Melbourne radio and television. Our second guest and speaker is Honourable uh, Kevin Andrews from the Liberal Party of Australia. He is a member of the Australian House of Representatives. He is the former Minister for Defence, as well as Minister for Social Services, Immigration and Citizenship, Employment and Workplace Relations in the Australian Parliament. <coughs> Our third guest and speaker is Senator Kimberly Kitching from the Australian Labour Party. She was a senior advisor in the several ministries under Victorian Premier Steve Bragg. She was also a member of Melbourne City Councillor in the early 2000s. She's someone with a vast corporate experience as well. Last but not least, we have Ms. Meryl Swanson. She's a member of the Australian House of Representatives from the Australian Labour Party. Before joining the House of Representatives, she has spent many years working as a, a, a media personality in radio broadcasting in Melbourne and Newcastle. Now I would like to pass on the mic to the uh, esteemed speakers. Thank you. Very well. Um, uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you for coming today, and uh, we really appreciate it. I'm leading this delegation of Australian parliamentarians who are introduced by Jama. Um, it is an honour to be here, and several of us, of us have met His Holiness before, but to be here on what we in Australia would call on his home turf or his home ground as is added meaning to, to, to the visit. And we have been to the, uh, to, the, to, the, um, to the Tibetan children's village, we've been to monasteries, we've been to nunneries, we've been to schools. We've seen the work that uh, your government in exile does over here and it's given us a, a much bigger appreciation of what is happening here. And we're learning about White Wednesday, how you preserve your, uh, how you preserve your traditions, uh, the fact that uh, the middle way approach um, that uh, Umar Ram is, 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 is so passionately in the forefront of all Tibetans, both in Tibet and also in exile. Um, the Greens in exile, as they say. Um, I, I've met His Holiness several times, but I have another Tibetan connection today because um, uh, going back to 1988, I was in television doing a current affairs television show. And in 1988, as you are well aware, that was when the bloodshed of the Chinese uh, in, in, in Lhasa and the peaceful demonstration by the monks uh, ended in bloodshed. And that footage came around the world and came to Australia uh, to my desk and my producer's desks. And we had to work out what was acceptable to show on the 6 o'clock news in prime viewing time. And as you'll be well aware, you can show some things and not some others. And so we saw the rifle butts being smashed into the monks' heads, and we saw them being shot, and we had to edit some of the bloodshed out. And this week, here, we met Bugdro. And Bugdro, whom you're all aware of, the fact that he, that he spent, who shot in the leg, he led that peaceful protest, was shot in the leg and spent four years in a Chinese jail. And it didn't break him even though he was tortured. And the fact that he got out and we met him here, continuing his work and all the books he's written, and the fact that he told us that when he came out, and this shows you the power of his holiness, when he came out, he said to us, he just wanted to get a gun. He wanted to get a gun and seek revenge. And um, the Dalai Lama, the Dalai Lama convinced him that was not the way, that the way was the, the MWA, the middle way approach, which he had been pushing since, what, 1974. You've had conferences and conventions about it, 2007, 2000, 2008, 2010, and you've had official and unofficial visits and contacts with the Chinese government since that time. And I think if it hadn't been for the middle way approach, that would have been lost, and you would have had the dreaded, um, dreaded consequences for Tibet. I'll just briefly tell you one more thing before I pass over to Kevin Andrews, and that is that we, have a, we had, years ago, an expression in Australia called populate or perish. 
and that meant increase your population, your immigration, populate or perish. And as I said to His Holiness the other day in Delhi, um, the Chinese for a while there, maybe still, had this a different version of populate or perish, and that was through the Han and other, other peoples, they would populate Tibet in the hope that you would perish. And you won't perish, because we've seen the signs here. Your, back, your background, your backbone, and your passion will see you through. And I, I probably should have said it when I left His Holiness in Delhi. I said to him, I first met him in 1993, I think it was, 92. I said to him, see you again in 15 years, Your Holiness, in Tibet. Thank you. Can I begin by thanking the Central Tibetan Administration for inviting us here to India, uh, in particular here to Dharma Salah, for the opportunity of meeting in Delhi on our way here, uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and for the opportunity of meeting with uh, the Minister for Finance, the Secretary for International uh, Development, uh, the Deputy Speaker of the Parliament, and many other people uh, who represent various aspects of the Tibetan culture and the Tibetan people here in India. It's a great privilege with my colleagues to be here on this occasion. For me, this is a fact-finding mission. It's an opportunity to have discussions with the various people that I've mentioned about the current predicament of the Tibetan people, not just here uh, in their host country of India, but to learn more about the situation which prevails at the current time in Tibet. The middle way approach has been promoted by His Holiness the Dalai Lama and by the Tibetan parliament in exile for many decades now. And it remains just as relevant today as it did a decade or two decades ago when it was first promoted. The autonomy of the Tibetan people is something which has attracted the attention of world leaders. Uh, presidents, prime ministers, chancellors, and many other world leaders from various countries around the world have spoken from time to time about the need to resolve the situation in Tibet. And part of the reason for us being here as members of the Australian Parliament is to add our voice to those international voices. We believe that the situation in Tibet needs to be resolved. The middle way is an appropriate way to do that, which stands between a full separate independent country and the current colonial situation which prevails under China. I believe that the middle way approach needs to be continually spoken about and pressure placed on the Chinese to bring about uh, an end to what has been an intractable situation for many years and many decades. And I'm sure that we will go back to Australia and continue to add our voice within the Australian Parliament and more broadly internationally to bring about a peaceful resolution to this ongoing problem. So thank you again for the opportunity of being here. Firstly, I would like to say one of my favourite greetings, and that is Namaste. So the light within me honours the light within you. And I certainly feel that this is uh, the most appropriate uh, greeting uh, here in Dharamsala. Um, it's been a, um, a very interesting and incredibly, uh, an, an incredible privilege to be here and to see, uh, not, to meet not only Tibetan people, but also um, to, have a, to develop an understanding of the institutions um, that have been created here. And I'll come back to those um, shortly. Today in Australia, the Foreign Affairs White Paper has been released. This will have some bipartisan support in Australia, so both of the major parties will support it. I come from the opposition party, um, and Mr Andrews comes from the government party. But Australia does have a strong belief, and certainly the shadow Foreign Affairs spokesperson, Penny Wong, um, has been very keen to emphasise a liberal rules-based order for our region. And that approach is reflected in today's uh, Foreign Affairs White Paper. And I would urge you all to go and have a look at that. It's on the Foreign Affairs website, the Australian Department's website, because it does have quite a significant explication of Australia's thinking going forward in this terms of this region. One of the other emphases that is in that paper and certainly has been emphasised by my party, the Australian Labor Party, uh, has been an emphasis on regional stability. 
we feel that that is the, really the only way forward um, to have all peoples of the region living in peace with good government. And I think that that is a very important um, point to make here today. I do want to come back to the institutions um, that we have seen that have been established here in Dharamsala. And po possibly I think my favourite was the Tibetan Children's Village, uh, which was um, a place of such happiness. It's one of the happiest places I've been to. And it was lovely to see the children and to understand how they're schooled. It reminded me a lot of Israel and the emphasis on education that is given in that society. And as we all know, Israel has become a powerhouse, uh, both economically and culturally. So I would like to say congratulations, and it is such a privilege to be here. Um, and it's, um, we have been given, shown every measure of hospitality we could expect. So, Tuche, thank you. Good morning, and thank you for showing such interest in our delegation this morning. Thank you to the Tibetan Central Authority for giving us the privilege to visit such a unique and majestic part of the world. And I would firstly like to thank the Indian government uh, and India as a country for hosting us here. Dharamasala is such a beautiful place uh, as we sit here at the foothills of the Himalayas. I would also very much like to thank the Tibetan people who have been so kind and generous to us in the last few days. It has been a wonderful opportunity to learn more about your culture, about your thinking, and about your hearts and souls. You are an erudite, elegant, and enlightened people. I was most encouraged to visit your schools and so pleased to see the education system that you bestow upon your children. Their grasp of many languages is very impressive and the happiness in their faces and their, their bodies is a wonderful reflection of the hope for Tibetan people. You have masterfully continued your remarkable culture through great difficulty in exile, and I congratulate you for that. And I feel personally very encouraged, and I think that you are exemplars to the world of people maintaining hope, but not just maintaining hope, maintaining a culture, educating future generations, and living truly as enlightened citizens of a world that is in desperate need of such wisdom. Thank you for, for your hospitality and your graciousness. Thank you for your wisdom and the silent but strong way that you continue to pass on the way of the Buddha and the way of Tibetans in our world. We are, we are a world in great need of such wisdom and I urge you to continue to pass that on to all of us for the future. I feel very personally encouraged and also indebted and very, very, very grateful for the experiences that I've had in the last few days. And I look forward to going home and sharing the wisdom that I have gained with my colleagues and friends and most importantly, my family, particularly my children, and uh, encourage them to read about what you have done and about His Holiness. And uh, it was a great honour and privilege to spend some time with him as well. But my deepest gratitude to you. Thank you so much. Thank you to our poor esteemed guest speakers from the Australian Parliament. Uh, we would like, now I'd like to open the floor uh, for questions from the press. <coughs> but uh, kindly speak out your name and the agency that you represent before you ask the question. No questions, we can go home. No. <laughs> oh, yes. My name is Ogen Tenzin. I'm from Radio Free Asia. 
Uh, can you a little bit uh, tell us about your meeting of His Holiness Dalai Lama in Delhi? What do you have mentioned to His Holiness and what His Holiness has told you? Okay, our meeting with, uh, with His Holiness in Delhi. Uh, we spent probably uh, 40 minutes uh, with him uh, in, in Delhi. Um, I had uh, met him on, uh, I think, three occasions before. It was a great privilege. And, so, and you had met him before as a city councillor. Um, I can't tell you some of it, because some of it he said this is all incompetence, <laughs> as he does. But uh, he, we, I was actually had some criticisms, uh, I must admit, because I, I said to him that both personally and your, your religion is a very optimistic religion. Um, I said, with, on a pessimistic note, I said, Your Holiness, you, you got the Nobel Prize in 1989. You, you, um, you have been pushing for the middle way approach since 1974. Um, you have been occupied since the late 1950s. Uh, where do you keep, get your optimism from? But as you've heard from other speakers today, and now that we're here, I realise, I know where you get it from. And, I'm, and I can see not only uh, from, from him, but from all of you, that you, 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 you know where you want to go. You know you deserve autonomy. Um, there is the feeling, of course, that uh, there is hope because unofficial talks go on all the time that we don't know about. But the other point here is that he pointed out that there are 300 million Buddhists in China now. Um, and that uh, even the president's mother is a Buddhist. And that was seen as being with that large and probably growing Buddhist uh, population of China that is optimistic for you. But maybe as a former journalist, I took a pessimistic view of that. I thought, well, if there's 300 million of you in China, that's a large percentage of Chinese. Maybe it sees you more as a threat than, <laughs> than as a peacemaker. But I think the thread that we've got is that as China becomes even more and more of a, of a world power, of a dominant world power, that they will seek, I can put it, the respectability of being a world power and therefore will be judged as well on the way that they treat the autonomous regions and, 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 and different uh, ethnic groups within their community. And that could be encouraging that they can show how benign, as an economic giant, but as a, as a benign giant, they can show that, look at what we've done for the Tibetan people. We've given them the autonomy that they need, even though, and it still stays under the Chinese, Chinese constitution, we, it, we are still one large Chinese community. It's still a one China policy. And you notice when you, whenever the Dalai Lama meets with um, President Obama or other world leaders, every note that comes out of the White House uh, refers to a one China policy, but also supports His Holiness and says that the, uh, the middle way approach is the way to go. Okay. All right. If, uh, oh, sure. My name is, uh, is Denzel Mello. I'm from Paris.com. So uh, the last visit of His Holiness to Australia was in 2015. And recently, uh, his uh, visit in 2017 was cancelled. And uh, the next is going to be in 2018, right? So why do you think the gap is a bit uh, bigger than the rest of other uh, countries that he visits? And uh, uh, President Turnbull, he had, sorry, Prime Minister Turnbull, he had said that he is not planning to meet him. So why do you think that there is a bit of, you know, uh, safe, playing safe? Uh, I, 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 well, why, why the gap between visits, I honestly don't know, but there is absolutely no antipathy between the Australian government and, uh, and His Holiness, because if you go back in recent years, and a rec only a very short time ago, uh, in the Senate, where Senator Kitchen and I are, and in the House of Reps, we have passed motions of support for, um, for Tibet, uh, for, the, um, the, for the, uh, the middle way approach, and they have been very... Um, very generous, awful word, but they've been very almost gushing in their support uh, for for the Tibetan people and for the Tibetan cause. Um, I understand from this visit that that His Holiness um, is cutting down on a lot of his visits overseas, and as I understand it, in recent times he's he is concentrating even more on on efforts in India itself because he is now going back personally and exploring uh, pre-Buddhist. Uh, Hindu um, traditions and trying to encompass all of uh, Buddhism to learn from where, from whence you came, from what started you. And so I think you're going to find, uh, I'm speaking for him, but I think you're going to find him travelling less internationally and more around here. And uh, I know, I mean, this week he's travelled all over the place. Uh, 
Minister would meet him? I'm sure he would. A Prime Minister Turnbull? Yeah, well, Kevin, you answer it for me, but I'm well, sure uh, we, we would certainly urge the Prime Minister to meet with His Holiness. Uh, other world leaders have met with His Holiness. Uh, both former Prime Ministers Rudd and Abbott uh, have supported the middle way approach. So Australia's view about this is quite clear uh, on both sides of politics, both the Labor Party and the Liberal National Party, uh, in former Prime Ministers Rudd and Abbott. Uh, have supported the middle way approach and as Senator Kitching pointed out in the Foreign Affairs White Paper that was released in Australia uh, today, there is a, uh, a great uh, thrust towards how we achieve regional security uh, and peacefulness and the ability of all nations to be able to cooperate with each other, uh, particularly in the Asia Pacific <coughs> region. And, and I think you'll also find that going back a few years, there was that fear at times, with not knowing where China was at, that other Western nations sometimes were a bit worried, if we meet with the Dalai Lama, will that affect economic ties with China? I think those days are over. I think that if you saw from some of the statements made by President Obama, he didn't give a damn about the fact that it might offend China if he met with the Dalai Lama. And you look at, in Europe, uh, the embrace of, of His Holiness uh, shows that you can still support the one China policy, but you're not, you're not going to um, break off ties with China because you are also embracing the Dalai Lama. Okay? All right. Yes. Hello, I'm Milan Hapuchizu. I work for North America. And um, thank you for um, supporting the Tibetan political um, prisoners. You've been given an assignment to them. And uh, apart from the business deal with China, what are the biggest challenge for you to lobby uh, the pa parliamentarians to support the Tibetan cause, both from the opposition and the government government? Well, I think uh, probably Kevin, he's, he's from the government side, and, 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 and Senator Kitching from the, the opposition. I'm just one senator, so you want to answer that for now, Kevin? Um, the, the approach that generally Australia has taken to these issues is that uh, we can, on one hand, trade with China. China is obviously uh, a growing world power, but at the same time, we need to ensure that there is respect for the rights and the liberties of all people within the world. And that has been our approach. It's not one or the other. It is an approach that says that trade is important, but trade uh, is one of a number of aspects of foreign affairs and international relations. And Australia, I'm sure, uh, regardless of which party is in power from time to time, uh, we'll continue to maintain that position. And it's one which we've clearly maintained publicly uh, towards China, uh, and I'm sure will continue to be the case in the future. You said one of the goals. Personally, I'd love to see more Tibetan students uh, come and study in Australia, especially in Victoria, right? Victoria, the state of Victoria, where three of us are from. <laughs> Mr yeah. Andrew, yes. Senator Hinch and I are from, uh, represent um, in varying aspects the state of Victoria, which is in the south, um, south southern part of Australia, uh, has a very successful educational services uh, sector. And, um, and as a result, because we have a lot of young people who come there to study, it is a very vibrant, very multicultural um, community, I think, in Melbourne particularly. And uh, education is that state Victoria's biggest export. So that is why we're going to get some more Tibetan students down there as well, OK? okay. Thanks very much. Thanks for coming. We really enjoyed it. And we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.